Well, here we are, uh, more than a year and a half after the Great Recession ended, and doesn't it feel good? Happy days are here again. But jobs are still hard to find, government services are being cut, and a dreadful austerity fills the air. And this is 20 months into a so-called recovery. It was an awful recession. GDP, or orthodox economist's favorite measure, contracted by more than 4%. That's more than twice the post-World War II average. The downturn officially lasted six quarters, a year and a half. That's a half again as long as the average. Employment, the measure that matters to most people, fell by more than 5%. That's twice the post-World War II average. And then fell another 1% after the recession officially ended. It didn't, but employment didn't bottom out until February uh, a year ago, 2010. Total job loss then over 6%, or 9 million jobs. Recovery over the last year has been very weak. We've only gained back about a million of those and lost nine. So eight of the nine jobs lost during that recession are still gone. The unemployment rate has come down a bit off its peak, but the reason, uh, but a lot of the reason for that decline is that people have simply given up looking for work uh, because uh, they found the, the search to be hopeless, and so they're no longer officially counted as unemployed. A broad measure of unemployment, what the Bureau of Labor Statistics calls the U6 rate, that uh, accounts for people who want full-time work but only find part-time, as well as those who've given up the job search as hopeless. That was 16.1% last month. That's more than 7% above the more official, familiar rate of 9%. It too has come off its peak, but it remains enormously high by historical standards. At recent rates of job creation, it would take about eight years to recover the jobs that we lost and to get the unemployment rate down solidly below 5%. And good things that happen when the unemployment rate gets below 5%. Wages tend to pick up, employers become less abusive, and the population is a little happier. It wouldn't mark a return to Eden for sure, but it would be a lot better than life with an unemployment rate almost twice that high. But sad to say, the economy and the job market are following almost perfectly the script of a post-financial crisis recession. They take years to recover from. Uh, in some cases, the lost jobs are never recovered, uh, according to some studies that the IMF did uh, a year or two ago. But as they say on TV, that's not all. The 2002 to 2007 expansion was the weakest one in modern history. Jobs were created at a rate that was about a third the average of the post-World War II expansion. A combination of that tepid expansion, which was preceded by a long period of job market weakness, and the Great Recession, means that employment in the U.S. is now 3% where, below where it was a decade ago. There has never been a period in U.S. history where employment declined over a 10-year period. The worst previous reading of 10-year reading over since modern stats began in 1939 was a gain of 22% over 10 years. That was the previous worst, was plus 22%. We're now at minus, 20, at minus 3%. So uh, there's a 25 percentage point gap between the previous worst and the current uh, reading. So remember, back in the 90s and uh, parts of the 2000s, cheerleaders used to love to talk about the great American job machine. Uh, but that machine has now popped a gasket. So how did we get into this mess? We all know the story uh, of the proximate causes of the economic crisis. A housing bubble enabled by not merely massive applications of credit, but credit packaged in unimaginably complex and obscure forms and then a dispersion of responsibility that came with securitization. Nobody is ever really responsible for scrutinizing the quality of loans. So there's a synergy of troublemaking here. Mortgage debt, after rising gently through the 80s and 90s, exploded after 2000, rising from about 60% of after-tax income uh, uh, at the uh, beginning of the decade to a peak of 100% in 2007. Uh, we all know that lending standards deteriorated to the point where the only requirement for getting a loan was having a pulse, and I bet you could even find some exceptions to that rule. Down payments became almost optional. There was a point where I think 40% of first-time home buyers didn't even make a down payment. The habit of packaging more mortgages into bonds and selling to distant investors removed any incentive for the original lender to scrutinize the creditworthiness of the borrowers and then allowed trouble to proliferate around the world when things went bad. Now, my use of the word of the bond, the use of the word bond there is as quaint as a down payment because the finest minds of Wall Street uh, assembled all manager, manner of mortgages into co complex derivatives that almost no one, even some of the people who sold them, could understand. I think there are actually literally only a few hundred people in the world who could understand the derivatives around which uh, these mortgages uh, were packaged. 
Uh, investors had absolutely no idea of what horrors were hidden in the so-called structured products that they bought, even though they, many of them came with a AAA rating. The rating agencies either didn't know what they were grading or didn't care. The issues of the securities themselves were the ones who were paying the bills, so the rating agencies didn't want to ask any questions. As one rater put in a famous email, they'd rate things put together by cows. But these weren't put together by cows, they were put together by investment bankers, who were far more dangerous. Now, all this stuff is true, this uh, standard story of the economic crisis. But it's a mistake to look at only that part of the story. Today's crisis also has a prehistory going back to the problems of the 1970s and the neoliberal prescriptions for fixing those problems. The problem of the 70s was, of course, stagflation. The stag part, stagnation, is actually rather misleading. The expansion of the Carter years saw job growth four times as rapid as that of the George W. Bush years, and GDP growth half again as high. For the whole decade, GDP growth in the 70s was also half again as high in the 2000s, but such a comparison for employment is impossible since job growth in this decade is negative. Now, there, there was actually there was an interesting gap between job growth and GDP growth between the Carter years and the George W. years. It was uh, jobs grew almost as rapidly as GDP during the Carter years, but much less than GDP during the Bush years. And that gives them a hint of the contrasting class dynamics of the two eras. Labor got a much bigger share of, uh, of the action in the much criticized 1970s than it got in the most recent decade, which is a clue why it's been so fashionable to make fun of the 1970s. And the recovery so far, uh, such as it is, is even more strikingly unbalanced than it was the last expansion. Profits are up almost 50% over the last year, wages and salaries up 3%. That's a 17 to 1 ratio. Uh, a 3 to 1 ratio is average. 17 to 1 is absolutely unprecedented in uh, modern American history and, of course, completely scandalous. But the inflation part of the 70s was important. The CPI hit 15% in 1980 and an annualized rate of 18% in March of that year. Wartime inflations were common throughout U.S. history, but never this chronic and deteriorating long-term sort of inflation. But inflation wasn't just about rising prices. It was also about sagging productivity, falling profitability, limp financial markets, and less quantifiably, a general loss of discipline in the workplace and an erosion of American power in the world. Corporate profitability, which had peaked at about 11%, uh, that is, dividing profits by the underlying capital stock in 1966, fell by two-thirds to under 4% in 1980. With high inflation, holding bonds became a losing proposition. Treasury bonds were nicknamed certificates of confiscation. And to listen to some of the fever talk in Wall Street now, you'd think we were back in that era now. Stocks turned in one of their worst decades ever, not as bad as the 1930s, but close to it. But it wasn't just numerical indicators. The US lost the Vietnam War, although I learned this morning that there's a Mark Jacobs uh, boutique in Ho Chi Minh City, uh, which made me more, real wonder who really won or lost the Vietnam War. But uh, oil and other commodity exporters were jacking up prices, and the third world was demanding redistribution on a global scale. Though it's largely forgotten now, the working class was restive and rebellious in the 70s. Formal strikes were common, as they were in the 50s and 60s, but so were the wildcat kind. Back in 1970, Richard Nixon called out the National Guard to deliver the mail because the postal workers wanted a self-organized strike. They had no real union. Later in the decade, we heard a lot about the blue-collar blues. And in 1978, the appropriately named country singer Johnny Paycheck scored a hit with Take This Job and Shut It. Obviously, something had to give, and what gave was the working class, domestically and internationally. Paul Volcker came into office in October 79, declaring the American standard of living had to decline. And then he made that happen by driving up interest rates towards 20% and creating the deepest recession since the 1930s. We just beat that record, but it took three decades. To the one-sided class war, Reagan added the ammunition of firing the air traffic controllers, uh, and it was open season on organized labor. Wages and social spending were squeezed, and the deregulatory agenda that began under Carter was intensified. Abroad, Latin America was thrown at the debt crisis, a crisis for a while that threatened to take down the whole global banking system. But instead, the problem was solved through the now uh, familiar neoliberal agenda of privatization and opening up to cross-border trade and financial flows. This program was very successful on its own terms. The recession scared the hell out of the working class. People were glad to have a job and wouldn't dream of telling anyone to shove it. Business became essentially free to do whatever it wanted to. 
Profitability recovered strongly, rising throughout the 80s and 90s to a peak of over 8% in 1997. Not quite back to 1966 levels, but still more than twice the, the, the low it had reached 15 years earlier. It took a while, but productivity finally joined in. In the military and political sphere, the U.S. power was enhanced, and we kicked the Vietnam syndrome. Discipline problems were a thing of the past. There were a few interruptions in this lovely picture. A stock market crash in 1987 that looked scary for a while, a long stagnation jobless recovery in the early 90s, and the, the uh, bursting of the dot-com bubble 10 years later, followed by another jobless recovery. But all in all, the system managed to recover from and even thrive on its troubles and state managers had perfected their bailout techniques. Of course, each bailout laid the groundwork for the next bubble, but Alan Greenspan famously said that one needn't worry about bubbles because one can always repair the damage after the fact. He lately seems chastened on this particular topic. But through these bubbles, busts, and recoveries, one constant persisted. A system dependent on high levels of mass consumption has a hard time living with a prolonged wage squeeze. I mean not, not only in the economic sense as of maintaining uh, high levels of ag aggregate demand, but also a political and cultural one. American life is very insecure and volatile, and uh, the ability to buy lots of gadgets assuages that to a considerable <coughs> degree. Mass consumption staves off what could be a serious legitimation crisis. For the last few decades, the economic and political contradiction of this has been managed, if not resolved, through the liberal use of debt credit cards at first, and then mortgages from the mid-90s onward. That explosion of household credit, uh, near doubling in the, uh, the debt-to-income ratio between 1983 and 2007, is what made the booms and bubbles of the last three decades possible. This is especially true of the 2001-2007 expansion, which featured the slowest employment and aggregate wage growth of any cycle since the numbers began in 1929. Without the massive cashing in on the appreciating home equity, Americans withdrew several trillion dollars worth of home equity during the decade of boom and spent a large portion of it. It grew, accounted for about a third of the growth in consumption during the decade. Consumption would have languished and the home improvement business would have gone under. And since we have almost no domestic savings, much of the cash came for this whole adventure. It came from abroad, from places like the People's Bank of China. Lest you think that my analysis tying debt growth to increased inequality is just the fevered product of a radical mind, let me assure you that recently got some support from a very orthodox cor uh, corner. Last November, the International Monetary Fund, normally thought of as a bastion of economic orthodoxy, uh, uh, published a working paper with the provocative title, Inequality, Leverage, and Crisis. The, in this paper, IMF economists Michael Kumhoff and Romain Ranciere wondered aloud whether the increase in inequality we've seen over the last few decades contributed anything to the cause of our economic crisis. They attempt to model, in that rigorous mathematical fashion that economists love to do, the perception that poor and middle-income uh, households borrowed aggressively to maintain or even expand their standard of living, while wages and employment growth were growing only weekly, at the same time that rich households had more money than they knew what to do with, so they sought profitable opportunities to lend all that spare cash to those below them on the income ladder. Kumhoff and Ranciere draw parallels between the recent period and the 1920s. In both cases, the share of income claimed by the top 5% rose dramatically and by a similar magnitude. During the 20s and the recent period, roughly the last 25 years, the ratio of household debt to underlying incomes doubled. The re recent increase in inequality is truly remarkable. For men, uh, this is the example that the IMF economists give, but uh, you could say pretty much the same for the broad economy, the best paid 10% saw their incomes rise by 70% adjusted for inflation uh, in the 40 years ending in 2007. Wages of the middle fell by 5%, and wages of the bottom 10th fell by 25%. The numbers for women are less striking, but the overall experience of the population over the last 40 years has been one of enormous polarization. This should be shaping our entire political discourse, but it's rarely discussed openly or honestly. I might add, parenthetically, that inequality in the U.S. is worse statistically than it is in Egypt or Tunisia. Of course, being poor in the Middle East is a lot tougher than being poor in the U.S., but still, the quiescence of our population amidst this vast, sustained, and designed polarization has been stunning. <coughs> 
Sometimes conservatives defend income inequality in the U.S. by appeals to our instinctive but untested assumptions about mobility in the U.S. That is, the alleged ability of people to raise their incomes over time over that of their parents or their own young selves is thought to compensate for the high levels of inequality at any given moment uh, when you take a snapshot or a cross-section. <clears throat> but actually this excuse doesn't hold water. The U.S. is no more mobile and is often less so than other rich countries. That is, people here are no more likely or often less likely to surpass the income levels of their parents than they are in Western Europe. And the U.S. today is, if anything, less mobile than it was a few decades ago. Over the last 25 to 30 years, non-rich households have increased their indebtedness far more than those at the top. Back in 1983, the richest 5% were significantly more indebted relative to their incomes than the bottom 95%. That position has since reversed. Almost all the increase in U.S. debt ratios uh, that near doubling have come from the non-rich portion of the population. At the same time, the financial sector has grown enormously, and more on this in a moment. A major reason for this growth has been its arrangement of all that borrowing and lending between the capital owning class, the top 5%, and the bottom 95%, the workers. And by the way, despite, despite the Marxist cash of those, the Marxist cast of those labels, uh, the class labels, they come from the IMF economists, capital owners and uh, workers, not me. We don't have the same sort of detailed statistics covering the 1920s, but the broad outline is very similar. Polarization offset by increased borrowing followed by a major financial crisis. In their analysis, Kumpoff and Ranciere, following the argument of the IMS former top economist Roger Ron Rajan, uh, argue that growing income inequality created political pressure not to reverse that inequality, but to instead to encourage easy credit to keep demand and job creation robust despite stagnating incomes. So what is to be done in the face of this? Kumpoff and Ranciere, the IMF economists, say quite plausibly, but there are only two ways of dealing with our present pickle. On the one hand, we can have an orderly debt reduction, a policy of slow and careful write-offs and debt forgiveness, rather than a massive default leading to further financial crisis. We've already had some of that, but we've only just made a dent in the indebtedness. But if worker incomes uh, don't rise, then you run into the same problem all over again. People have to borrow to maintain the standard of living, leading to a rerun of the whole scenario that led to this current debt crisis. And the political will for this sort of orderly debt reduction is lacking. The administration's policy on mortgage relief, for example, has been so modest that it barely amounts to anything. A second possibility is, of course, as Kumhoff and Ranciere put it, a re restoration of workers' earnings, for example, by strengthening collective bargaining rights. That is, raise wages and strengthen union power. This looks politically even less likely than mortgage debt relief. Here in Wisconsin, of course, your governor has launched a war on wages and collective bargaining rights among public sector workers, but uh, he's simply uh, one of the most aggressive in the country. He's got plenty of uh, colleagues uh, in this uh, uh, anti-worker agenda. Since mo mo most private sector workers have no bargaining rights to speak of, the right has been able to turn workers' resentment of those who do to its political advantage. Instead of leading to political pressure for extension of rights to private sector workers, the political path of least resistance seems to be dragging those who have those rights down. This is a per perverse form of egalitarianism, that's what we've got right now. Comoff and Ranciere acknowledge the political obstacles to the wage-raising strategy, but as they put it in that gentle and sober way that mainstream types are fond of, the difficulties of doing so must be weighed against the potentially disastrous consequences of further deepened financial and real crises if current trends continue. Restoring equality by redistributing income from the rich to poor would not only please the Robin Hoods of the world, we could also save the global economy from another major crisis. That's the end of the quote from the IMF guys. Of course, it looks like nothing of the sort is happening. Austerity looks to be the way of the present and the future. I quoted that IMF paper as noting an enormous increase in the size of the financial sector. I'd like to say a few words about that uh, before uh, looking at uh, what, what perhaps awaits us. I had initially thought that the financial crisis that began in 2007 and got truly awful in 2008 would put an end to the long rise of the financial sector in the U.S. economy. Maybe not lead to a major political transformation, but at least lead to some downward adjustment to Wall Street's enormous economic and political power. But it didn't happen, did it? If anything, Wall Street has used this crisis to enhance its power, uh, or at least to demonstrate it. There are several dimensions uh, to Wall Street's rise to preeminence over the last few decades. 
one could simply be measured in money. For example, in almost every year since the U.S. national income accounts began in 1929, Securities and commodities brokers have been the highest paid of the almost 90 industries reported by the Bureau of Economic Analysis. And that uh, premium, the securities industry's premium, has grown over time. Uh, back uh, at the end of World War II, the uh, uh, securities industry earned about 180% of average annual pay. Uh, that grew to over 300% in 92 and over 400% in 1996. It's fallen back a bit. Uh, but it's still as close to 300 uh, to 400 percent in 2009. That's more than twice its premium at the end of World War II. Or take profits. As the bull market was about to take off in 1982, the financial sector claimed about 12 percent of total corporate profits. Its share nearly tripled into the 2008 peak to 34 percent. It fell uh, dramatically during the heat of the crisis, but now it's since back to over 30 percent. So uh, the financial shares, uh, the financial sector is collecting almost a third of all corporate profits in the economy, even though it, that it employs less than 6% of the workforce. Or take the proliferation of assets. Financial assets of all kinds were about uh, not quite 500% of GDP in 1982. That's more than doubled to over 1,000% uh, at its most recent reading. So here's the story the numbers tell us. After a long period, uh, mainly the golden age of the post-World War II decades through the 1970s, Wall Street was something of a torpid backwater. Its denizens lived well, but not large. But since then, they've accumulated an enormous amount of wealth, and with it, power and prestige. A couple of personal anecdotes that support these numbers. A few people would migrate from, the, uh, from Yale to the financial sector on graduation. I did, actually, but it was a brief, low-paying diversion. But it was hardly a flood of people. It was not a common career path to go from Yale to Wall Street in the 1970s and early 80s. One of my undergraduate friends came out of a Wall Street family. They lived well, but all, all that, not all that much differently from everyone else. They had a house in the Hamptons on the east end of Long Island, but it had been passed down through the family. The patriarch who first bought it went bankrupt during the Great Depression and moved out there as a low-cost refuge. Now it cost, what, like $5,000 a week for a summer share in the Hamptons. Now there is no data on that house in particular, but the neighboring property is valued at $22 million. As Kingman Brewster, uh, Yale's genteel upper crust president in the early 70s, put it in my freshman Facebook, back when that was a document on paper, the days when people roll like bowling balls from Wall Street in New Haven to Wall Street in New York were past. Enjoy the privilege of doubt, he further counseled us. The year before, in 1970, Brewster, who could count two passengers on the Mayflower among his uh, ancestors, had said, I'm appalled and ashamed that things have come to such a pass in this country that I am skeptical of the ability of black revolutionaries to achieve a fair trial anywhere in the United States. It's impossible to imagine the president of Yale saying anything like that today. Nor is it possible to imagine any Yale president cutting back in the number of legacies undergraduates admitted largely because their parents went to Yale and gave the university lots of money, as Brewster did. The U.S. elite has changed rather substantially over the last 40 years. When Brewster encouraged incoming students to doubt, Yale's endowment was worth less than $500 million. Fourteen years later, when uh, Yaleys were rolling like bowling balls from Wall Street uh, in New Haven to Wall Street in, uh, in New York, one-third of Yale's graduating class applied for a job at the investment bank First Boston. By 1985, the endowment had doubled in nominal terms. That sounds nice, but it was really just keeping up with inflation. But then it really went in a tear uh, and led to uh, the transformation of Yale into a university attached to a hedge fund. It, the endowment passed $5 billion in 1997, $10 billion in 2000, and $20 billion in 2007. It's fallen back some at the bear market, but uh, now it's still uh, higher than any level before 2005 when the university was hardly begging for quarters in the street. But still, Yale now feels very poor, and it's cutting its budget and laying off staff. Then there's the issue of power. The financial sector has surprisingly little to do with raising money to finance real corporate investment. It rarely does that. It's been, uh, this is especially true of the uh, stock market. Even the boomiest years of the late 1990s dot-com bubble, uh, initial public offerings of stock to public investors, financed only about 5% of total corporate investment. If you look at another uh, another way, if you combine net equity uh, offerings, which uh, means uh, if you combine what uh, corporations offer to the public in the, term, uh, the way of stock, uh, less what they buy for the public uh, in stock, that is uh, 
in such things as takeovers and buybacks. Uh, these net equity offerings have been negative almost all the time since 1982, because corporations have been taking each other over, which means transfers of cash to the, uh, t uh, the, uh, the shareholders of the target firm. And they've also been very aggressive at buying back their own stock to increase uh, its value, and all have also been just been paying old-fashioned dividends. So if you combine all these methods for shoveling cash into uh, the pockets of shareholders, non-financial corporations have been uh, shipping off um, uh, nearly 100% of uh, their surplus, profits plus uh, depreciation allowances, uh, to, uh, to their shareholders. So um, corporations have found it far more uh, preferable to hand over money to the shareholder class than ha they have to hire workers and invest in capital equipment. So businesses do get outside financing, but the most important source of that is old-style banks. So what exactly does the securities industry do? Let's be generous and concede that it does provide some financing for investment. But the, an enormous apparatus of trading has grown up around this, not merely trading in certificates, but control over entire corporations. I think it's less fruitful to think of Wall Street as a financial intermediary, putting together borrowers and lenders, or investors and uh, 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 those who need investment, than it is to think of as instrument for the uh, establishment and exercise of class power. It's the means by which an owning class forms itself. It allows the rich to own pieces of the productive assets of an entire economy. So while at first glance, the tangential uh, relation of Wall Street, especially the stock market, to financing real investment might make the sector seem right for tight regulation and high taxation, its centrality to the formation of a ruling class makes it a very difficult target politically. For a long while, shareholder uh, ownership was more notional than active. <coughs> After the 1929 crash, Wall Street sort of receded into the background, leading us the go uh, le uh, giving us the golden age of Galbraith's managerial capitalism. But when economic performance faltered in the 1970s, when the golden age was replaced by a bronze age of rising inflation and falling profits, Wall Street, meaning shareholders, finally asserted themselves. They unleashed what had uh, been dubbed the shareholder revolution, demanding not only higher profits, but a larger share of them. The first means by which they exercised the control was through the takeover and leverage buyout movements of the 1980s. That was followed by a shareholder uh, 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 assertiveness of the 1990s, a shareholder activism, pension fund activism in the 1990s. But compensation structures were rejiggered to emphasize uh, stock over direct salaries. The idea was to get managers to think like shareholders, since they were uh, now uh, maturely under that, under the new regime. Uh, the pension fund activism sort of petered out uh, as uh, the 90s wore on, and in the 2000s, uh, it hardly became visible. Managers have been paying them, paid themselves enormously well while stock prices languished. If the stock price wasn't cooperating, uh, managers could always backdate their options. The problem is especially acute in the financial sector. Bank of America, for example, bought Merrill Lynch because its former CEO, Ken Lewis, coveted the firm, and if the shareholders had any objections, he just lied to them about how the brokerage firm, uh, the uh, financial health of the brokerage firm. It was as if the shareholder revolution had hardly happened. But still, Wall Street maintained enormous political power uh, on a national scale. Uh, it uh, uh, demonstrated that during the financial crisis and its aftermath. Financiers may bellyache about increased regulation over the last couple of years, but the actual changes have been very minor. The major bill that changed the regulatory architecture, nicknamed Dodd-Frank, was pretty weak key to start with and is being watered down as the detailed regulations required by the legislation are written. Soon after the House passed the bill, Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner went on Lawrence Kudlow's TV show to correct the perception, uh, common in the so-called business community, that the administration is anti-business. The choice of outlet is interesting. Kudlow, a former Reagan administration official, is a militant supply sider and all-around right-winger with a one-dimensional worldview. Geithner appealed to that one-dimensional worldview by assuring Kudlow and his CNBC audience the administration of plans to keep a lid on the favorable tax treatment of capital gains and dividends and emphasized that the president understands deeply that governments don't create jobs, businesses create jobs. The, the administration has a pro-growth agenda uh, said Geithner, which is a phrase that Kudlow loves to use himself. But despite all these efforts to placate business, capital remains fairly hostile to the administration and its modest regulatory efforts, 
which will no doubt prompt further efforts by Obama and company to placate business, efforts that will never satisfy and will still have to be repeated and repeated. So in return for hundreds of billions in public funds used to keep the financial system from going under, banks will emerge from this crisis largely unscathed. One reason for this is Wall Street's skill at lobbying and its ability to spread huge amounts of cash around Washington. According to Public Citizen, between 1998 and 2008, Wall Street spent $5 billion in campaign contributions and deployed 3,000 lobbyists across Capitol Hill to get its way. While $5 billion sounds like a lot of money, it was less than a third of Goldman Sachs' bonus pool for 2009 and spread out over a decade. Wall Street has a lot of money and Congress can be bought pretty cheap. But as I argued all earlier, Wall Street also represents the commanding heights of the economy, a central mechanism by which a ruling class economic power is formed and exercise. It's only surprising to people who don't understand this that Washington dance, dances so faithfully to the banker's tune. You might think in a crisis like this, which has both exposed the nature of class power in the US and exposed millions to foreclosure, unemployment, and poverty, you might think a crisis like this might lead to some constructive response in the political sphere. But sad to say, much of the radical energy in the US so far is coming from the right. That actually isn't all that surprising. According to research by a couple of economists, Marcus Bruckner and Hans-Peter Gruner, using uh, European evidence, economic troubles increase the vote for far-right parties in uh, elections, but not far-left parties. The rise of the Tea Partiers in the US, reminiscent of the rise of the militias and Ross Perot during the economic problems of the early 90s, not to mention the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980 after the stagflationary crisis of the 1970s, success, uh, suggests that similar forces operate in the US. Maybe years of stagnation will change this political landscape in ways I might find congenial. But as of now, Wall Street looks to have consolidated its power. As I said earlier, this moment looks to be all about austerity. At the federal level, the president of hope and change has been talking about nothing but cuts, and the Republicans in Congress want more. We're getting more of the same at the state level. As I, I spoke earlier, citing the IMF economists along with my own preferences, on the appeal of pushing wages up. Clearly, that doesn't seem to be on tap. It goes against all the instincts of the American politi uh, political and business classes. It also seems impossible to go back to that old polarizing borrow model of doing an economy. The housing market is still busted, as are the consumer credit markets. Retail spending is picked up from the deaths of 2008, 2009, but we're not going back to the old pace of spending anytime soon. An interesting class point, the pickup in retail sales that we have seen over the last year or so has been led by the so-called luxury sector, with discounters in second place. The upper orders are doing well, everyone else is trading down, and the middle is looking rather hollow. And despite being flush with cash, corporations are not investing or hiring, the job market remains very weak, and a minor revival in capital spending looks to be petering out. There are possibilities other than the simple strategy of raising wages. With the, uh, while the encouragement of clean energy and other green technologies uh, might seem to hold great promise for generating fresh growth over the longer term, in addition to saving life on Earth, the political and financial systems seem to be incapable of getting there. A ruling class, such as it is, seems to have lost the capacity to think beyond the next quarter or an election cycle. New Jersey's thuggish new governor, Chris Christie, has just canceled his state's participation in a rail tunnel across the Hudson a, product, a project that would not only create jobs in itself, but would have long-term productivity payoffs. He says the state can't afford it. He's not alone, but he's since turned back to his true passion of firing teachers and breaking their union. A number of newly elected Republican governors are looking to kill the modest high-speed rail projects funded by the stimulus bill. I think that's not just a budgetary thing. I suspect a lot of these governors think that trains are for pansies and real men get around in escalates. <laughs> At first, it seemed like the Obama administration might take a few steps in the right direction. I was encouraged by in this hope back in May 2009 when I heard the then chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, Christina Romer, give a talk at the Council on Farm Relations in New York, the trade association for the old Northeastern establishment. Romer said that what the US economy needs is a smaller financial sector, higher levels of real investment, and a more equitable distribution of income. She noted that the high consumption gain days, uh, days of the US economy were past, and what we needed now were new sources of growth. Government couldn't be a fertile source of jobs after the stimulus, it would have to retrench. 
residential investment was tapped out after the long bubble. Exports weren't likely to help much since the rest of the world at that point wasn't thriving. So it had to come from business investment, and by that, Romer meant green technologies. She was also critical of the growth of finance over the last few decades. She said that bubbles waste talent. People who should be doctors, engineers, and teachers ended up doing deals and trading bonds instead. In the Q&A following her talk, an audience member observed that most of the people in the room had made their money over the previous 20 years on what he called the outsized returns available in the financial markets. Were they going to have to do something different, he asked. Make things, she answered. That evoked a hiss from the audience. <coughs> I'd hoped that Romer was sent on a mission to say these things to important people uh, that matter by the White House. But in fact, Romer was soon sent packing. She left the administration last summer. And I later found out through a mutual friend that she wasn't instructed to say any of these things. She was freelancing on her own. Romer was also one of the people in the administration who, along with Larry Summers, said that they were well aware that they should not repeat the mistake of 1937. That is, after administering large doses of fiscal and monetary stimulus, as the Roosevelt administration did between 1933 and 1936, that stimulus shouldn't be withdrawn out of fear of inflation, and that the, uh, the assumption that things were indeed finally returning to normal. When they did withdraw that stimulus in 1937, uh, the economy fell off a cliff, unemployment skyrocketed. And you have to wonder if we're now on the verge of repeating a very similar mistake. <laughs> Back to green tech. It's a historical fact that many of the major industries in the US got their start through public subsidies, from the railroads of the 19th century through the computer and pharmaceutical in industries of the 20th. There would be no internet without the Pentagon. But to late, today's political elite will hear little of this. There was a $5 billion fund for clean energy R&D in the stimulus package. But that was later rated to fund uh, the Cash for Clunkers program which is a program of little economic and even less environmental <coughs> payoff. My friend Christian Parenti has written about how even something as mundane as a concerted public procurement program, that is getting the federal government to buy lots of clean vehicles and such, which would reduce the cost of producing the things and could spark a uh, broader uh, adoption of these kinds of vehicles. But even that kind of uh, modest and sensible policy really can't get off the ground in Washington. Meanwhile, the Chinese have been building high-speed rail like crazy and are surging forward in solar and other green technologies. In a piece last fall <coughs> on the Chinese uh, rail effort, the Financial Times led with a vignette of Arnold Schwarzenegger shopping for equipment in Shanghai, as the paper put it, looking for trains, technology, and funding for the planned high-speed upgrade to his state's rail network, much of which was built in the 19th century by Chinese laborers. The Chinese rail sector, it's worth pointing out, is dominated by state-owned firms. I was in a crazy TV debate with a Tea Party stockbroker type recently who was talking about how China is now no more capitalist than we are. I don't want to say that China's state-heavy system is socialist exactly, but it is a lot more effective at doing this sort of thing than is our haphazard nonsense. But as I said earlier, our ruling class just doesn't want to think this way. And to be honest, right now they have no incentive to. In my catalog of our economic woes, I forgot to emphasize the fact that the upper crust hardly seems to be suffering. At least until recently, productivity has been rising, not because of high-tech investment as it did in the two, uh, 1990s, but because workers are, uh, employers are working their employees harder and paying them less, delivering a nice fattening of corporate profits. A friend who works for a hedge fund told me recently that 9% unemployment looks to be good for the stock market. Stay long capital, he spelled out with a K, and you should do okay. Of course, not all of us, knows that only our labor power to sell can stay long capital. But as you may have noticed, this is not France. At least for now, the unemployed do not burn cars. <coughs> the already employed do not uh, do much to fight austerity, although I hear there's a nice exception to that this afternoon. And uh, high school students do not go on strike to defend old age pensions and uh, stage enchanting kiss-ins in the processes they did in Paris.